Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God. This movement is funded through the generous, sacrificial giving of people and churches throughout the world. World Evangelism Giving is the foundation for discovering, developing, and resourcing our missions organization and has enabled the Church of the Nazarene to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to unreached people and places. It is the cornerstone of our denomination's missional funding, with the largest portion of giving going to missions work in the Nazarene regions. These funds enable the regions to effectively implement church planting and discipleship strategies through local churches and ministries. Every church and individual in our denomination participates with their financial contributions to world evangelism, binding us together with a unified purpose and vision. Because of your giving, the Church of the Nazarene is able to develop and sustain worldwide communication, technology support, and new mission programs. All Nazarene missionaries, regardless of deployment status, benefit from the Missions Foundation created by World Evangelism Giving. Each missionary receives support, such as funding, insurance, and missionary care. Nazarene Missions International, Nazarene Youth International, work and witness, global missions, and many other ministries are supported by World Evangelism Giving. Independently funded ministries like Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, Jesus Film Harvest Partners, and World Mission Broadcast also benefit from the infrastructure it sustains. Through your giving, new churches worldwide are able to make an impact in their community. Those funds also train and equip pastors and church leaders in these churches. Pastors like Rafi, who fulfilled his call to ministry after escaping war-torn Syria. Today, Rafi and his mother Lena have started two Arabic-speaking churches in Poland. Your giving funds clergy development and ordination in the Church of the Nazarene and makes holiness education available worldwide through Nazarene institutions of higher education. Your giving provides resources and literature in more than 90 languages to churches all over the world. This includes resources for pastors and Bible-based teaching materials for children, youth, and adults. Because of your giving, schools like the Armstrong Primary School in Côte d'Ivoire are impacting their community. School children are being taught Christian values, and the students and their families are being reached for the Lord. In Mark 12, we see the beautiful example of a widow giving abundantly. Jesus calls his disciples and points her out as the one who gave the most, because she gave all. Our focus is not on how much we give. We give because we believe in a missional God who is at work through our Nazarene missionaries, reaching places and people we can't even imagine. We believe in a God who moves, and that belief, deeply seated in our hearts, moves us to give. We are a global church, a generous church, participating in the transformational love of Jesus Christ in our local communities. Together, through our world evangelism giving, we share Christ's love with the world.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Sobre todos é o teu Jesus Fonte da salvação, só tu és Jesus Digno da minha vida, tu és Jesus Eu sou teu, oh eu sou teu Eu sou teu Tressa que é sombra lá tua Comparable Pour mes yeux à ta beauté Déverse ton cœur en moi Révèle ton amour Et en moi Passionné de ce que tu aimes Worthy of every song we could ever see Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. Aan zijn liefde is daar geen einde. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. O seu amor dura para sempre. To him who alone those great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day. The moon and stars to govern the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. And brought Israel out from among them. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. And brought Israel through the midst of it. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites. Potomosto, Milosibo, Naviaki. And Og, king of Bashan. And gave their land as an inheritance. Car sa miséricorde dure à toujours. An inheritance to his servant Israel. Se amor, te dura pa todo tempo. He remembered us in our low estate. Nora vogol mutsuna avitiane. And freed us from our enemies. Uska prem sadaki he. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Tonight, 
Our dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we welcome you to this service of thanksgiving. This has been a most unusual year, and yet we are drawn toward giving thanks and praise to God. In the first century, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Philippi. And I know as leaders, we're not really supposed to have favorites, but many believe that this was Paul's favorite church. He loved these dear people who were learning what it meant to live for Jesus in a Roman colony. This was a town filled with people who took pride in having status, wealth, and power. Life in the church was one of a great contrast where the people of God were called to follow the humility of Jesus. Paul wrote to the church, and we read what he wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Just imagine that Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison in Rome. These were difficult days. These were days that would eventually lead to his death, and yet he was filled with praise and thanksgiving. The church in Philippi had sent one of their members to Rome to help care for Paul. Along with this person, they had sacrificially sent financial support. No wonder he wrote, I thank my God every time I remember you. He had a person with him who was a living reminder of the faithfulness of the people of God. Pastors, leaders, laypersons, we thank God every time we remember you because we have seen you in action throughout these past months, through these months of the pandemic. The Lord knows what you have accomplished, 
and how much you have done for his kingdom. Words of gratitude remain on our lips and in our hearts as we think about the sacrificial ways you have remained interconnected and the ways you have supported one another throughout this unusual season. I thank my God every time I remember you. In Philippians 1, verse 3 and 4, Paul's thanksgiving is expressed in prayer. He said, I thank God in all my prayers for all of you. Thanksgiving and prayer appear to go hand in hand for Paul. His thanksgiving is directed to God for the believers. The insertion, all of you, prayers for all of you, emphasizes inclusiveness. This is not a prayer for a segment of the church. It is a prayer for the whole church. It is characteristic of Paul to include all, regardless of where they are on their spiritual journey. Paul believed in shared participation in Christ. They were united in Christ. Paul identifies himself as one with these believers. They were all the body of Christ. Paul gave thanks for all regardless of their status because he believed that Christ makes it possible for humanity to know and experience full salvation. He had confidence that God continued his work in their lives and their circumstances and context. Another important aspect of this text is the insertion in all my prayers. In all my prayers suggests a regular ongoing habit of prayer for the sake of the church. In his regular ongoing habit of prayer, he offers thanks to God for the church. Paul's prayer was characterized by communication and communion with God on behalf of others. It is love and concern for the church that leads Paul to converse with God, at least in this particular context. Paul petitions and intercedes for the church's sake. He presents himself and expresses a willingness to participate with God in carrying the world's burdens and the burdens of the church. Like Paul, we are thankful for the church not a segment of the church, but the whole church. We are thankful that the church is continuing to deepen its knowledge of God and experiencing his work in and through us. In particular this year, 2020, we are thankful for the way the church is responding to the global pandemic and the many other challenges that our world is facing today. The church has been selfless in many ways. Thousands, if not millions, inside and outside the church have experienced the love and care of God through the church. This does not mean that we are superhumans. There is no question that there is exhaustion, loss, grief, frustration, and even mistakes that have been made along the way. But through Christ, the church is continuing to rise from strength to strength. We are convinced that this is a result of the many prayers offered for and by the church. So in this Thanksgiving service, we offer thanks to God for the church. We thank God for in Christ, we all have become participants in his mission. We thank God for the work he's doing in and through the church to restore and to redeem the world. We thank God for his gift of grace for salvation and deliverance from the power of sin. We thank God for continuing to perfect holiness in the church. Our thanksgiving is filled with joy. 
How could Paul say, I always pray with joy? Always? Consider this. He wrote these words in prison, victim of gross injustice. Some common words to describe a prisoner are frail, useless, in the dark, disrupted, broken, humiliated. There is no sense of joy in any of those words. Paul refused to let them take over the delightful thoughts that the Holy Spirit brought out of his relationship with Christ. Paul decided to trust not to himself, but to the Holy Spirit, the keeping of his joy. In his case, the joy of seeing how his brothers and sisters were engaged in the proclamation of the gospel. In Philippians 1, 4 to 5, he said, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul was all about proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. So partnering in it gave him nothing short of this abiding, consistent joy. The same tone is found in verses 12 to 14. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. The word advance or progress of the gospel comes to us with brilliant sense of pioneering, which is the heart of an apostle. The church is about Jesus and our partnership in this gospel. We share Paul's joy in seeing how the church is pioneering new ways of sharing the gospel, discovering methods and using tools that are very new or have long been waiting for us. As a result, people are hearing the gospel in many contexts and by multiple means. That is joyful. Anyone wanting to know the importance of joy in the life of the church needs to read the letter of Paul to the Philippians. The whole book is about joy, and the center of it all, I believe, is chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says there, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. We are to do as Paul and as Jesus, who rejoiced in the Lord for the same reason, the gospel advancement. It is in Luke 10, 21. At that time, and the time was when the disciples came with an exciting report of how the gospel was advancing. Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. Even when the reaction to the gospel is not positive, be joyful. Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Brothers and sisters, Jesus promises us complete joy in these words, John 15. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is not the only time Jesus promises complete joy. Preparing his disciples for his own departure, he said, Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Until now, 
You have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Such is the nature of Christian life. The joy that we are instructed to have is not to be a fruit of our own labor. It is given to us. The promise comes from Jesus who trusts the Holy Spirit to fulfill his promises. In Christ, joy is always waiting to be claimed. It is ours and it is complete. The Apostle Paul is filled with joy and thanksgiving because he was firmly, fully, absolutely convinced of the purpose and the power of God. He is confident that what God starts, he will finish. He writes in verse six, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I think it's important for us to know that God starts the work. In fact, his work for us began when Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. First Peter chapter two, verse 24 reads, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. His work for us started with the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And his work in us begins when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse nine, Paul wrote that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That means you and I can know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior if we'll simply confess our sins and ask him to be our Lord and our Savior. And if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that today. I think it's also important for us to remember when and where and how we started in the faith. And we need to keep the wonder and the awe of being a child of God. May we never forget where we started and where he has brought us to today. Paul was also thankful for the Philippians' participation in the gospel. With their help in planting the church in Philippi, he was thankful for their growth in grace and their Christian life as a whole. He was thankful that the one who began a good work in the Philippians will carry it on, will perform it, literally will go on completing it. Here Paul is suggesting that the Christian life is really a matter of con a continuous surrender to Jesus. And he reminds us that it is not yet complete, that it involves a progressive transformation of our lives. You see, God is at work within us through his Holy Spirit. God wants to continue to make improvements in, in my life and, and in your life, in my character and in your character, in my spirit and also in your spirit. And here's the good news. God will help us to continually grow in his grace. So whenever you get discouraged, remember that God won't give up on you. And when you feel distressed by your own shortcomings or failures, you can be assured that God is at work daily in your life, putting on the finishing touches to make you more and more like Jesus. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Well, I have even more good news for you. In verse six, it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, God will finish his work. He will bring it to completion in your life 
in my life. He will accomplish it for us. And today we can be thankful for the continuing work of God and the work he has initiated by his spirit. What he has initiated, he will complete it. So let's do what Hebrews chapter 12, verse two tells us to do. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith. And let's be thankful. The Apostle Paul finishes this wonderful Thanksgiving greeting with both a celebration and a prayer of hope for the church in Philippi. In verse seven, he writes, it is right for me to feel this way about you, since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Paul's message to the church in Philippi was a reminder that nothing would stop the work of the church, that whether in prison, or at the courthouse defending himself, whether in a time of pandemic or in a time of economic distress, the people of God did not stop witnessing and sharing the grace of God. It is no wonder that he wrote to the church in Corinth celebrating the ministry of the Macedonians. They included those who lived in Philippi, the capital of the Macedonian state. In the midst of a very severe trial, he said, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, they welled up in generosity. He continues, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. See, this is the church that in spite of the trials and tribulations of this unique season, we feel blessed to be counted with you as part of the global family of Christ. Together, we have endured this pandemic we have served together, we have cried together, and we have celebrated together. And as the Apostle Paul affirms it, God testifies how much we long for you with the love and affection of Christ Jesus. Yes, that's exactly how we feel. We wish we were there with you in person at your table. Yes, we, we have missed being with you at your district assemblies, at your pastor's retreats, at your ordination service, Yes, we have missed partaking with you at the table in the fellowship of the saints. And yet, we have witnessed how you have shared the grace of God with us, with your congregations, and with your communities. We have been with you in your online services, your email prayers, your outdoor services, and many other ways that show the world that the Church of Christ is sharing the grace of God, whether in social isolation or with many multiple limitations. We truly identify with Paul's words. It is right for us to feel this way about all of you. We celebrate you, our global family. And it is in this spirit of celebration and hope that we want to leave you with a prayer and a blessing that contains the word of God through Paul to the church. Our prayer is that first and foremost, in these days of tests and trials, in this season that may be marked by economic and social distress, and even by political uncertainty, that you, our beloved family, will be able to display the genuine and deep love of Christ. We pray a sincere prayer of hope that when the current pressures of our world subside, you will be found blameless and victorious, that you will raise the banner of God's righteousness in love and charity, that you will be known by sharing both love and light, and that you will do that for the glory of God and for the salvation and transformation of the people in your communities. We pray that the Church of the Nazarene will be known in every town and in every country by the genuine love, real generosity, true solidarity, and outstanding charity that we will display in the midst of the worst trials and suffering. A hundred years ago, we were a small family that was present in less than 20 countries when the pandemic of the flu hit the world in 1918. Back then, we endured 
We survived, thrived, and became known for our resilience, our solidarity, and our ministry to the lost, to the least, and to the suffering. This time, 100 years later, we are positioned to do the same by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus and to the glory of God, we will do it. Let us pray. Father Almighty, we come before you with thankful hearts for the global family that in you, your divine grace we call Nazarenes. We are thankful for your protection during these difficult days of the pandemic, and we pray for the continuous protection for those who even today are exposed daily to this horrific virus because of their work or their daily circumstances. Please cover them with your hedge of protection. There are literally hundreds of thousands of your children who have to continue working in spite of the pandemic so that they can fulfill their role in society and bring bread to the table. Please protect them, we pray. Father, we pray for provision at every table. We know that there are countless families whose eco economies have been impacted by the prevention measures accelerated by this pandemic. We pray that you will provide the daily bread in all of our homes and that you will sensitize and mobilize your church to work in solidarity for those who hunger today. Give us bread to satisfy our hunger. Make us hungry for your righteousness. We pray that you will bring peace to our lives and to our communities. We pray that your love will be displayed in the lives of all of us who carry your name so that the world may know that you are Lord by the way in which we conduct ourselves as agents of unity, of love, compassion, righteousness, and grace. And above all, we pray that your name will be glorified in our lives as we continue bearing the name, the name of Jesus, the Nazarene. Let it be so. And now, Nazarene family, please receive our blessings. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. su amor y te muestre favor Dios te mire con agrado y te de paz
세대 위에 가족 위에 자녀 위에 자손 위에 자손 위에 내 해를 바보 뜨지 말고 한 사람 부시도 딱뛰라 가라나 올라디 웃는 깊이 올라디 Sua presença te acompanhe por detrás e por diante 